Good morning and thank you for joining us today. We're going to be thinking about some parables in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus taught about the Kingdom of Heaven. But let's start by singing God's praise in hymn number 15 in Singing the Faith. The splendour of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. about the splendour of your majesty and the certainty that light triumphs over darkness. We have reminded ourselves that you are ageless and eternal, far beyond our comprehension. We have sung about how great you are. We have compared you to both a lion and a lamb. We are little creatures, rather afraid of lions, somewhat more comfortable with lambs more at home with the here and now than vast expanses of glory. We praise you because even though you are so great and splendid and so far beyond us, yet you reach out to us. Our mundane little worlds are as much your concern as the splendour of the heavens. Name above all names, we are thankful that you know our names. Help us to lift our gaze from our own here and now, to the vastness of your eternity. Amen. Lord Jesus, forgive the narrowness of our vision and our lack of imagination. Forgive us when we allow our dreams to be stifled by what is practical, when we concede defeat instead of claiming victory when we live as citizens of this world 
rather than citizens of heaven. Forgive us, Lord. Enlarge our vision. Increase our faith. Amen. We listen to our Gospel reading now and we hear some of Jesus' teaching about the Kingdom of Heaven and it's Kate who's reading for us today. Today's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 13 verses 31 to 33 and 44 to 52 and it's a set of parables that Jesus tells about the Kingdom. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen poured it up onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish into baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, Every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Thanks be to God for his word. Have you become a lockdown baker? Apparently a lot of people have and quite a few of them have taken to baking their own bread especially if their usual loaf was not available in the supermarket. There were just a couple of problems with this though. Firstly, it's been hard to get flour, although they tell us that that was more because of a shortage of the right size flour bags than an actual flour shortage. And secondly, yeast became hard to come by. Unable to purchase yeast in the shops, some intrepid bakers took to making sourdough bread. If you're going to do that, you need a sourdough starter. I haven't tried it myself, so everything I'm telling you now comes straight from the internet. There are lots of sourdough starter recipes, so I looked up one for beginners. It's flour and water. You mix it, then you leave it. Over the next several days, you add more flour and more water, and eventually it's all bubbly and it has a life of its own and then you can use it in your sourdough bread recipe. Or you could make pizza dough with it, which I might try one day. I don't make bread, but I do make pizza. The thing that makes your sourdough starter go all bubbly is yeast. It turns out that even if you can't get it in the shops, it's just floating around in the air anyway, waiting to be captured by your mix of flour and water. You can't even see wild yeast but it has a dramatic effect on your sourdough starter and it will make your bread rise. A little bit of yeast works through the whole dough. This is shop-bought yeast. It's dried, not fresh, and it's what I use usually if I'm making pizza. 
and the packet says that this much yeast is enough for one pound or 500 grams of flour. So that's seven grams of yeast for 500 grams of flour. A small amount of yeast works through the whole dough. In our Gospel reading this morning, Jesus says that the Kingdom of Heaven is like that little bit of yeast. Whether you've picked it up in the supermarket or whether you've captured it in your sourdough starter, it only takes a small amount of yeast to make the whole dough rise. It's a similar thing with the mustard seed that Jesus was talking about. It's tiny, it looks unpromising, and then it just gets buried in the earth and left there. But it puts down roots, then a shoot appears, it gets bigger and bigger until it provides shade for people and birds come to shelter in its branches, all from one tiny, unpromising looking seed. I discovered hollyhocks last summer. It seemed that wherever I went on my travels, there were hollyhocks. They were in the garden of Hereford Cathedral. They were in the north of Holland. They were in the Swiss Alps. Tall, colourful and gloriously vulgar. I loved them. And I thought about the boring grey garage wall that dominates one side of my garden. And I thought what that garage wall needs is hollyhocks. And so I bought some seeds and I planted them in a seed tray. Every day I looked at that tray of bare compost, hoping to see some sign of life. Eventually, the first shoot appeared, then some more, then some more. After a while, it was time to transfer them to pots, then to their position in the garden. My nephew works as a gardener, so there was a lot of texting back and forth, seeking advice and reassurance. But in spite of how knowledgeable he is, neither he nor I could force those hollyhocks, hollyhocks to grow any faster. They're about eight inches tall now, a long way short of those wonderful eight foot specimens I was admiring last summer. And they're not showing any signs of flowering either. I think I'm going to have to wait until next summer for full hollyhock glory. You can't force the pace, you see. But everything that's needed to produce the hollyhock or the mustard tree is in that tiny unpromising seed and that tiny amount of yeast is all that's needed to make the dough rise. There's another parable where some seeds fall onto poor rocky soil and some get swallowed up by birds and I'm sure we've all had our baking failures but in these two little parables there's a feeling of inevitability. Once the seed is in the ground once the yeast is in the dough, results will follow. We can't force them, but results will follow. Now the Kingdom of Heaven is not to be found on a map. There's no border control. There's no quarantine period, no matter where you've come from. The Kingdom of Heaven exists anywhere where Jesus is acknowledged as Lord. And sometimes, when we're watching the news and none of it's good, the Kingdom of Heaven can seem to be quite invisible. Noisier, more strident, sometimes malevolent forces appear to be in control of the world. But the Kingdom of Heaven has a foothold anywhere where Jesus is acknowledged as Lord and those tiny, unpromising little footholds are all that's needed for the Kingdom to grow. Just as surely as a mustard seed will produce a mustard tree or a small amount of yeast will cause the dough to rise, so the Kingdom of Heaven will ultimately prevail. Our opening hymn was all about the splendour of the King, and our prayers of adoration were all about glory and splendour and majesty, and all of the dazzling but less cosy imagery that we use to talk about God. I suspect most of us are probably more comfortable with the more down-to-earth imagery of the Bible, and you can't get more down to earth than planting seeds or baking bread. But from time to time, we need to lift our sights and brave all that brightness because that's how we know that God's kingdom will prevail. It may not look like much from where we are now, but all that glory and splendor remind us that what's visible to us here and now is not the whole story. It's God who's in control and it's God whose kingdom will prevail. 
But belonging to God's kingdom isn't only a question of being on the winning side. During 2016, when all the arguments about Brexit were raging, it prompted me to consider what I value about my Britishness. I concluded that I really don't care what colour my passport is, and anthems and flags are not particularly important to me either. What I found was important to me was our shared national values. Values of hospitality and generosity, being outward looking. And it upsets me when we don't always live up to those values very well. I would like to think that we do still hold them, however imperfectly. The Kingdom of Heaven has no flags or passports, but it definitely has values. And those values come with responsibilities, summed up most succinctly by the prophet Micah. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The Kingdom of Heaven is more than just a nice idea. It requires commitment. And in the parables about the treasure and the pearl, Jesus tells us that however clamouring and pressing the demands of this world may be, our commitment to God's kingdom should take precedence. When the pearl and the treasure were discovered, the people who found them gave up everything else they had for them. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, he says, If, for this life only, we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. I've always quietly disagreed with Paul about that. I've always thought that even if it was just for this life, I would rather live this way, according to the values of God's kingdom, than any other way. But it's easy for me to say that in this country, and according to our national values, we don't face anything more than mild ridicule for professing a Christian faith. In other parts of the world, it is far more costly. And perhaps, if I lived somewhere else, I would understand better what Paul is saying. The parables of the treasure and the pearl tell us that the kingdom of heaven is worth the sacrifice, whether it's our reputation and status that's at risk, or even our personal safety and security. Our citizenship of heaven should be of far more value to us than anything else. That's a challenge that might make us feel uncomfortable. And we might not feel very comfortable with the final parable either. A fishing net is thrown into a lake. It doesn't differentiate at all. All kinds of fish are caught together. The net is hauled to the shore. And then comes the reckoning. The fishermen sort through the catch and all the bad fish are thrown unceremoniously away. It's a parable that speaks of judgment. And we aren't all that sure how we feel about judgment. On the one hand, we'd much rather think about a God of love. Oh, surely God loves everybody, we say. The thing is, we can't have the love without the judgment. If God were to turn a blind eye to all that injustice and inequality and bigotry that we say we're against, that would mean that he didn't really care about it. We're expecting God to put things right in the end. But that will mean judgment. You can't declutter your house if you refuse to throw anything away. We can't have a perfect kingdom if it's going to tolerate all those systems and structures that perpetuate injustice and inequality. But even if we're uncomfortable with the notion of judgment, we still have issues with God's timing. We think judgment is too slow. We wonder why God isn't acting more quickly and more decisively. Why does God allow this, we moan? Why doesn't God do something about that terrible person, we complain? The fish were side by side in the net until after the net was hauled to the shore. 
The message of the parable is that God will act to put things right when it's the right time for him to do that. And that's a matter for his judgment, not ours. So what do we learn about the kingdom of heaven from this little series of parables? We learn that the kingdom is coming and that it will prevail, however unpromising things might look from where we are now. We learn that the kingdom is worth everything that we have and are and should be the most important thing to us. We learn that when it's the right time, God will deal with everything that's unjust and unrighteous and has no place in his perfect kingdom. Things will be put right in God's time. What we're called to do in this time of waiting is to choose to live now as citizens of heaven, according to the values of the kingdom, waiting confidently for God's kingdom to come in all its glory. Amen. We sing our next hymn as we prepare to turn to God with our prayers of intercession. It's hymn number 706 in Singing the Faith, Longing for Light, We Wait in Darkness. Christ 
as a response to our prayers of intercession this morning, after I say, Our Father in heaven, could you please respond by saying, May your kingdom come. After the words, Our Father in heaven, your response is, May your kingdom come. And so, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we look forward with anticipation to the day when your kingdom will come in all its glory, when all that is wrong will be put right and righteousness and justice will reign. Our Father in heaven, may your kingdom come. We pray for the footholds of your kingdom. We pray for everyone who acknowledges Jesus as Lord, that you would strengthen them in their discipleship. We pray for those who sow the seeds of your word into unpromising situations, that the seeds would grow and come to fruition. We pray for those faithfully acting as yeast in their communities, living as citizens of heaven to demonstrate the possibilities of your kingdom. Our Father in heaven, may your kingdom come. We pray for those who have given all for your kingdom, those who have left behind all that was familiar and may have been ostracised by their families and communities, may they see your kingdom in all its glory. Our Father in heaven, may your kingdom come. We pray for those who are victims of the powers and principalities of this world. We pray for those who are suffering because of prejudice and intolerance. We pray for those who are hungry because of economic systems which keep them out of work or on minimum wage. We pray for people who are bullied and intimidated by those who should protect them. Our Father in heaven, may your kingdom come. Heavenly Father, whose kingdom is everlasting, we ask these prayers in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn today is number 255 in Singing the Faith. The kingdom of God is justice and joy, for Jesus restores what sin would destroy. Welcome to us. 
by blessing one another, even though we can't see each other, with the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And age to age he stands And time is in his hands Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God has been in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our Lord, sing with me how great is our Lord, and all will see how Oh!